Okay, you guys, let's go ahead and do a quick video um, just working on our recognition of the types of tests that we're supposed to do and some hypotheses and conclusions along the way. Okay, so we're going to go through these. We're going to work on using Prezi. Uh, so Prezi is really good because it helps us kind of flow chart our way through. And it's going to be really important uh, for our examination coming up that we know how to work our way through our steps so that we finally get to the correct... Um, the correct test that we need for a given scenario. So I'm going to insert one more here. Give me just a second. And we'll also put a test up here. Okay, so here we go. Let's start on this first one. So it says, Janet is working for the highway department trying to prevent drunk driving. She recently got a report from the Fed stating that 10% of the accidents on the highway are caused by drunk driving. She thinks that for her state, this is actually grossly underestimates the true proportion of accidents on the highway that are caused by drunk driving. She goes and collects thousands of accident reports from her states to do her analysis. Okay, so the first question that we've been asking for a long time now is what type of data are we dealing with? So if we go into Prezi, the very first thing that we look at, at the very top, is what am I testing? And we know that this is categorical. There's a couple things here that help us out. The dead giveaway is the true proportion. So we're dealing with proportions. Next one, how many are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with one. She's just looking at the proportion of accidents on the highway that are caused by drunk driving from her state. So we've got one, and then we've got a question of, is it normal? Oh dear, sorry about that. We've got this question of, is it normal? And she's got taking thousands of accidents, so she's gonna have at least 15 with, that are caused by drunk driving, 15 without. And then we can do our, oh, give me a second. We can do our one sample Z test for a proportion. All right, great, so we can come in here and we can do just one sample proportion, or Z test for a proportion. Okay, our hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that P, or the true proportion, equals, and it's going to be 0.1, because that's what the Fed say. The alternative that she thinks for her state, unfortunately, is that P is going to be greater than 0 0.1. All right, so let's look at our results real quick. So if we empty those out, we've got, okay, our P hat is 0.18. We've got an alpha level, we've got a P value, and we've got a confidence level. Okay, so our P value is less than our alpha, so we can say that we have uh, significant results. Okay, so let's, let's work on that for just a second. Okay, so now we're on to our conclusion. So we can say that uh, we collected sufficient evidence at the alpha level of 0 0.05 to reject the claim that the true proportion of accidents uh, of yeah accidents caused by drunk driving in, let me see for a second, in Janet's state state is equal to 0 0.1 and conclude that it is in fact bigger. Okay, so there's that. We've got that right there. And now we can go to our confidence interval statement and make a claim about it so that we can say that we are 95% confident that the true proportion of accidents caused by drunk driving in... Janet's state is somewhere between 0.13 and 0.23. And there we go. 
Okay, so we we're able to do the whole thing. This is an important skill to learn how to do, how to get all the way from a basic scenario all the way to a confidence interval statement. Give me just a second. It is giving me some problems here. All right, so let's go into another one. OK, so here we go. We'll just go down to the next one. And we'll do, we'll try to get through all of these real quick. So the next one, Blake is starting out a new workout program. He's trying to determine what brand of protein powder to use. He was excited when he found a study where they pitted power powder, big builder, and strong stuff. They decided to give three groups of 50 randomly selected lifters these supplements and track how much larger their quadriceps got while on the supplement. They know that the size increases are roughly normally distributed. All right, so this one's pretty easy. As soon as you see like more than two groups together that you're trying to compare, we need to do ANOVA. And if we look at our Prezi, it'll take us there. So the first thing that we can see is what am I testing? I'm testing some numerical data. I'm trying to see the size of somebody's quadriceps and how many. It's not one, it's not two, it's lots. So we can come on over and we can see that. Next question is, is, is it normal? Oh, give me a second, I'm sorry. We'll just blow this up full size. Next question is, is, is it normal? And it says, we saw that it said that it was approximately so. Next one, are the standard deviations equal? All right, well, we should go check that. And let's look at our results. All right, so here it doesn't give us our standard deviations. We'd want to check this. Remember that when we are doing ANOVA or two sample independent testing with equal variance, we've got to check. If it doesn't say in the, the problem, we actually need to go and check the standard deviations. Remember, if the sample, if the biggest sample standard deviation is less than or equal to two times the smallest, we can assume uh, that the variances are equal. Okay. So here we go for our hypothesis. Let's take a second and do that. So for ANOVA, the null hypothesis is that the true mean quad increase for all of the protein, protein powders is the same. And then we can go and do the alternative, which is at least one true mean quad increase. At least one true mean quad increase uh, for a group is different than the others. Okay. So we got our null and alternative. So conclusion, first thing we want to look at is the p-value is significant. Okay, great. So we can once again say, we collected sufficient evidence at the alpha level of, we can say 0 0.04 to reject the claim that the true, and we'll take it from there, that the true mean quad increase for all of the groups is the same and conclude that at least one is different. Okay, now we need to do our confidence interval statement. Con remember, conclusions are just talking about the hypotheses. Confidence intervals, we actually get to talk about the differences. Okay, so we can say that we are, in this case, 96% confident that the true mean differences in quad size for the following powders are contained in the following uh, comparisons. Okay, and then I'm actually gonna come over here and I'm just going to copy this guy, copy and do an alt enter and paste this guy. Okay, so we're 95% confident that all of the comparisons have collected their respective 
a true mean differences. Okay, so now we just got to talk about the which ones are different. Now, you, these don't so sometimes they'll have p values to let you know which ones are significant, but if they don't have p values, we can also see if zero is contained within the interval, it means that s minus b or p minus s or p minus b could be equal. So zeros in here, they could be equal. Zeros in here, they could be equal. But here, we've got two negatives. Okay, so let's see which one. So now we can say that something to the effect of we found that uh, strong stuff, I think is what it was called, yeah. Strong stuff was found to be significantly, uh, we'll say that the true mean quad increase for strong stuff was out to be significantly less than, uh, what is it, Big Builder. That's all that we'd have to do on this one. Now, if there were more that were significant, more comparisons that, we, that were significant, you want to go through and talk about all of the significant comparisons and which ones are bigger. All right, let's go to our next one. Here we go. So we've got that Maureen wants to save money on detergent, but she is not willing to sacrifice the cleanliness of her clothing. She needs to pit generic brand against Tide. Um, so if she can show that Tide is significantly better, she'll continue to use Tide. But if she can't show that the true mean amount of dirt removed is better for Tide, she will start to use the generic brand. She suspects that the variances are not the same for each detergent type, but knows that they are both roughly normally distributed. She runs loads with the generic um, and detergent each 12 times with the loads that have equal dirt content and measure the grams of dirt removed. Okay, I'm gonna adjust this one real quick. So we're going to run, she runs loads with the generic. We'll put it 15 times, just to make it clear. 15 times and tie detergent 12 times. Okay, so now let's do our search. All right, so we're going to start at the top, and the question is, is what am I testing? So we're testing numerical data because we're looking at the amount of dirt removed, like grams of dirt removed. Okay, so now how many are we testing? We're testing two. We're comparing the generic brand versus the the uh, Tide brand. All right, is it normal? So uh, in within the problem, it says that it is roughly, that both of them are roughly normal. Okay, so that gets us through our normal statement. Are the samples independent or matched pairs? All right, so it's not matched pairs because they're not the same sample size. That's why I did that little quick change. We got 15 times for the generic and 12 times for the other. Now, uh, I could have left it the same because not only do they have to be the same size, but there also has to be a one-to-one -one link between the two. And, uh, but I just wanted to make it clear that this one was not matched pairs. All right, so then does each group have the same standard deviation? Going back here, it says that she suspects the variances are not the same. Okay, so if the variances aren't the same, then the standard deviations aren't the same. So it says it doesn't say so. So we'd be a two sample t-test for a difference in means. Okay, we're with unequal variance. So let's go ahead and put that in. So we'd have a two sample t-test and we'd say unequal variance. All right, hypothesis, the null hypothesis very simply is going to be mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And then we want to see if tide is significantly better. So if they remove more dirt, so we can say, and we'll put tide, I guess, as one. We can say that mu1 minus mu2 is going to be greater than zero. All right, so let's come over. Okay, and so here we've got our results. Uh, so we've got mu1 minus mu2 is We've got this uh, 4.5 p-value alpha. We've got a confidence interval and that the tide x bar is greater. All right, so let's go ahead and write a conclusion. Once again, we have significant results. So let's say we can say that we are 96% con uh, sorry. We collected sufficient evidence at the 
the alpha level of 0 0.04 to reject the claim that Tide and generic brand will say that the true mean dirt removal for Tide and the generic brand are the same and conclude that Tide in fact removes more. All right, so now we can go to our confidence interval statement. So we can say that we are 96% confident that the true mean dirt removed removed by tide is somewhere between 1 to 10 grams of dirt more than that of the generic generic brand and that's it for a confidence interval statement all right so we're there let's do one more and then we will call it quits like for the basically the whole semester here we go Jeannie is an avid fisher she doesn't have a lot of time though and she so she only wants to hit up pools where she thinks their fish will act she'll actually catch fish she has a sneaking suspicion that the number of fish per 100 feet of stream is directly correlated with the number of uh, feet of large vegetation on the bank like willows and trees she gets some game and fish report counts in the 40 streams and then grabs satellite images and able to measure the number of feet of vegetation and says assume basic assumptions are met okay so let's go to prezi and let's look at kind of what are we actually trying to measure all right so we're dealing with numerical by numerical and this is because she's dealing with she wants to be able to predict the number of fish that's numerical by uh, the number or the yeah so the feet of vegetation per 100 feet in the streams okay so this is comes down this moving mean and we're going to do a regression test of the slope okay so let's come in here and we know that this is going to be regression and for us it's going to be linear regression Lin okay and our last one let's go ahead and clear this out and we've got our alpha and our p-value and once again we've got significant results so let's get our null hypothesis the null hypothesis is going to be that beta 1 equals 0 or that the true slope is equal to 0 there is no relationship and then the alternative hypothesis is that beta 1 is not equal to 0 okay so there we go is greater than zero or is not equal to zero okay so we can say that so we collected give me a second collected sufficient evidence at the alpha level of 0 0.03 to conclude or we'll say reject the claim that there is no true slope to our true relationship between the number of fish and the amount of vegetation on the bank and conclude that there is a true relationship okay so now we're on to our confidence interval so we can say that we are uh, 97 sorry percent confident that the true relationship or true slope between uh, between the number of fish in the stream 
and the amount of vegetation on the banks is somewhere between all right, somewhere between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. All right, we need to do two more things with our regression. We need to also talk a little bit about what does the slope mean. So the slope means that for every additional additional foot per, uh, we'll say foot of vegetation per 100 feet of stream, the number of fish increases by 0 0.5. All right, so that's how we would do the uh, interpret the slope. And then we need to also interpret the R squared. So the R squared says, so we can say that 85% of the variation or the variability in the data is explained. by the model okay and that's it there is one thing that I wanted to to point out I had two small mistakes in here and I really need to change these because it's important so here we did a one tail test and we did a one tail test up here but we did a two tail confidence interval so we need to actually go in and fix this real quick so I'm gonna actually take that out and say that's going to be infinity right and then we also said that these two Sorry. That are mu1 minus mu2. We also need to put this guy to infinity. That so if you actually did the the one tail test and you ran it through our commander, it would actually give you the infinities because it knows that it needs to do a one tail test with these. So we need to say that we are like 96% confident that the true mean dirt removed by tide is instead of saying somewhere between, we can say just greater greater than one gram of dirt more than the generic brand. Okay, and then up above, if we go up higher, we could say, we could say is greater than here as well. Greater than 1.3. Since we're doing a one-tailed test, one-tailed test, we should be doing a one-tailed hypothesis uh, or a one-tailed confidence interval as well. And that's it. So I hope that that helps you out. We went through a whole bunch of different stuff. We went through Janet's scenario. We went through Blake's scenario. We'll come down, we went through Marine's scenario. And we went through Jeannie's scenario. So hope that helps you out. Good luck on the final.